Uh, greetings one and all. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now today we have a very special webinar session for you dedicated to teaching you the tips and tools that you'll need to develop healthy sense of self-regulation in your children, which is the foundation of one of our most important success skills, self-discipline. Now I have two young children of my own and let me tell you that I'll be watching today's webinar very closely myself as a parent as well as a school leader and applying all of this in my own home as much as I can. And in fact, to present to you today, we have one of our most knowledgeable practitioners and skilled presenters, our assistant head, Ms. Emily Visoven. And before we start, I'd just like to encourage you to stay right until the end because we have something very special today. We'd like to ask for your opinion on what Parent Academy webinar you'd like to see most come up next. And we'll use your opinion to help make our selection. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, I'll pass you over now to assistant head, Ms. Emily Visoven. Emily, over to you. Thank you very much, Justin, and welcome everybody to today's Parent Academy. So as Justin's already said that we're talking today about nurturing self-regulation. Um, as I do lead the session, please feel free to pop any questions you have in the Q&A section, and we'll come to those at the end, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. And um, I think with that, we'll dive straight in. So as adults, we actually, we already, if we're a functioning member of society, we probably already know how to self-regulate, but let's think about what actually is self-regulation. Well, in its simplest form, it's making yourself do things that you don't want to do. So for example, cleaning your house, um, because you know that it's something necessary or better for you to do. And it's, all, it's also stopping yourself from doing things that you do want to do, but you know aren't good for you. For example, eating this delicious chocolate cake and probably going for one slice too many. So to expand upon that a little bit more, when we're talking about the ability to, to self-regulate, we're referring to some of these things that you can see here. So the ability to regulate your emotions, which really requires an understanding of how you're feeling and also why you're feeling that way. Being able to manage your behavior to fit a social setting or an expectation. Resisting a highly emotional reaction. So resisting outbursts or tantrums in response to something upsetting. So for example, being told no more chocolate cake. Um, calming yourself down if you're upset, adjusting to change in an expectation or a routine, handling frustrations and annoyances without responding in a very over-emotional way. And so all of those skills are things that we have learned as adults to do over time. No one's really born with the ability to do them. And it's important to remember that these are skills, they're not innate abilities. So they have to be learned and taught. Now, of course, some children and adults actually suffer from dysregulation as maybe they've not yet learned to the skills to self-regulate or maybe they have an additional need. And what that means is they might have an instant or a really strong reaction to a situation or change, such as a tantrum or their distress might build up over time, eventually leading to a big outburst of emotion. And we see that most often in young children, sort of two years old. We talk about the terrible twos and that's because children are really learning to self-regulate. And some people do find self-regulation more difficult for a number of reasons, which could be just related to their personality or their temperament. It could be that they've had too much support when they were young and they're too reliant on, on co-regulation, working with an adult to help them regulate their emotions. Or it could be an additional need as well. Um, some things such as anxiety or attention defici deficient, deficient hyperactivity disorder that can also make it a lot more difficult for children and adults to learn or maintain the skills to, to self-regulate. However, most children, the vast, vast majority, will have no difficulty in developing their ability to self-regulate as long as they've got some steps to success in place. And today we're going to look at three key steps which you can take at home to support your child in developing this skill. So first of all, positive relationships. Now I speak about these all the time because they're just absolutely key to learning and development. They really are that first step. Um, and self-regulation is no exception in terms of that learning and development. So maintaining a warm relationship with your child where you constantly use positive language is really, really important. And it's something that you'll see us as teachers doing with your child as well. And we try to avoid things like, don't do that, be careful, stop doing that. 
and look for positives to focus on when we're interacting with your children and you can do the same at home so saying things like oh well done you're holding on really tight while you swing so you don't fall off that's such a safe choice um saying things like even though you were angry that your sister took your toy you still use words to ask for it back well done and in a situation where your child's learning to self-regulate, it's just so important to use that relationship and your interactions to develop those skills, being non-judgmental, being non-emotional, speaking about what's gone wrong, why, how they can fix it. And not only that, but actually modeling that you have to work hard to be thoughtful and reflective and self-aware. That's really important as well. So telling your child, I'm feeling really angry because something didn't go my way. But you know what? I'm going to take some deep breaths and I'm going to try and stay calm. Explaining that to your child is really important. They need to know that you as an adult are still learning. You're learning with them. So second step to success is the environment. Now, the environment that your child spends their time in is absolutely essential in terms of helping them to develop those self-regulation skills. So an environment that's consistent, that's the same every time, that's accessible, that's really well organized is really important. So in our classrooms, we try to make sure that everything is organized, has its own place so that children can tidy up or put something up, display something that they're proud of, keep something that they're working on. And that helps the children to stay calm and relaxed and to know what will happen next. And I think even for adults as well, anxiety really rears its head when we don't know what to expect. And it's exactly the same for children. So keeping your home as organized as possible can really help to avoid that, particularly those spaces that your child uses a lot. And an environment in terms of the, the atmosphere of patience and reflection is really important too. So if, you're, if your environment at home is overly emotional or really, really fast paced, things are changing a lot, you have lots of different people in and out of the house, that can really raise stress levels and it can make self-regulation a lot more difficult. Now, obviously there are times when change is going to happen, um, but as much as we can, we can prepare children for change as well, that's really important for helping them too. And thirdly, routines. So this is kind of linked to that environment and keeping everything organized. Um, routines are really important for children to know what's happening at each stage of the day takes away unnecessary stress and anxiety. It lets your child focus on building those self-regulation skills instead of using all, that cog all, all their cognition to focus on the stress and the sort of getting into flight or fight mode. Within the routine, it's really important that you, have, that you give your child plenty of time to play. We know that play is extremely important in developing these early skills. And sort of imaginative play is especially important and physical play too. Children learn a huge proportion of skills involved in self-regulation as they play. And we know that skills learned during play are retained a lot better. They're retained more easily than through other types of learning, just listening or being given instructions. And it's also worth considering in terms of your routine, whether you can incorporate some form of mindfulness or meditation yoga there's loads of great yoga programs out there for children um, but even something as simple as sitting quietly together for a few minutes listening to your breathing doing some breathing exercises um, or having just five minutes at the end of the day when they go to bed to sit and reflect that can really help both you and your child to stay mindful and relaxed so the main section of the webinar that I'm going to end with today, I thought we'd go through a couple of sort of common situations where children are developing their self-regulation skills. Um, as I said earlier, I think it's really important when we think about specific situations to keep in mind that these skills are skills to be learned. We have to teach them just the same as we do reading, writing, maths. Children are learning to self-regulate. And it's also important to keep thinking to yourself, if your child is having a tantrum or acting very emotionally, it's not that they're behaving badly. They just need more practice at these self-regulation skills that will help them to manage emotional situations. And as children need to learn those skills, it's important as well not to avoid situations that are difficult to handle. So instead, we need to coach our children through these situations and provide a sort of scaffold, we like to call it, to help them face the challenge, help them get to the next step on the ladder. 
Um, it can be very easy to get discouraged in some situations, particularly the ones I'll talk about now, especially if they happen every single day. Um, but it's important to notice the small steps and to remember to break down each skill into a small step and focus on one at a time and see those small steps of progress. Um, now, hopefully when I'm talking about these situations, I'm not going to be telling you too much that you already know. You're all experienced parents. I'm sure you've got a wealth of strategies that you use at home. Um, but I hope that some of these ideas will be useful and also just the time to reflect on what we can do in these situations, I think, can be really beneficial too. So let's look at the first one. Um, so here's the situation. So you've gone to the supermarket, you've popped in to pick up something for dinner. You've got your child with you because you're coming back from school or kindergarten. Um, most children don't particularly enjoy going to the supermarket, especially when they realise that they can't take anything they want off the shelves. So let's imagine you're there with your child and your child just every time you go, they want to walk around on their own. They want to take things off the shelves. They want sweets. And you're saying, no, 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 you can't. And then, of course, what happens? A huge tantrum, screaming, shouting, throwing themselves on the floor. I'm sure we've all seen it. I know I certainly have. Um, so that's obviously a really horrible situation, especially when you know you're in a public place where everybody's watching. So what can we do to make this situation such as going to the shops or going anywhere that your child doesn't like to go a more a smoother experience or an easier experience where your child can self-regulate their emotions so these would be my tips so first of all make a short visit to the shops or to whichever place that your child doesn't want to go when you don't really need to be there when you as an adult aren't under pressure to fulfill some sort of task and if you're not under pressure, then your child's not going to be feeling any of that emotion from you. Then think about the difficulties that your child is having. So if it's walking together, holding hands, set the expectation of what you want to do. I want you to hold my hand while we're walking. Tell your child that. Show them what you're going to do and try that together. And when they do it, offer lots and lots and lots of praise. If it's we're going to walk down here and you're not going to take anything off the shelves, exactly the same. Tell them what you want them to do. Let's try it together. Lots and lots of praise if they walk down one aisle without taking anything. And with these skills, make sure that you're consistent every single time. So if you want them to hold your hand when you're at the shops, then you expect that every single time and you always offer them praise when they do it. We know how important praise is in terms of switching on those parts of the brain um it's like it, it creates endorphins in the same way that eating chocolate does we know how important praise and attention is from our parents so remembering to offer that praise for every small step is really important okay so the second situation i think we see quite commonly we definitely see it at school as well um your child's been on the ipad for however long i don't know 10 minutes half an hour and you don't you want to limit screen time understandably so you say okay time to stop what happens when you ask them to stop? Well, of course, all hell breaks loose. Um, despite the fact that you told them at the beginning that they have a time limit, your child probably still can't cope with having, taken it, having it taken away. So what do you do in this situation? Um, now, many of these strategies we use at school as well. The first one we do, if we're setting any kind of time limit, which we always do when we're using iPads, um, it's we always have a visible timer for the children to see. And that will be a timer that's appropriate for their age. So it might be an egg timer if it's a child in three, four, five years old in nursery and reception. Um, it might be a clock if it's an older child. You might even want to have a timer just on the actual iPad that's going to beep when they finished. Um, because seeing that time going away, it, that allows the child to mentally prepare for when it'll be time to finish. Or alternatively, you might want to give regular warnings that the time limit is approaching so go to go and say to them oh only five minutes left now just two minutes left now okay one minute left don't start a new game now um so giving the children that warning and knowing having them know what is coming we talked about routines already then that's really important now obviously some children will still struggle to stop especially if they're really engaged in an activity that they love so if minecraft is their favorite thing they're playing minecraft they just cannot stop in that case I would suggest first practice transitioning away from an activity 
um, from a game that they're not so invested in. And you can tell them, look, I've, I've seen that you're finding it really difficult to stop playing the iPad. I think we'll have a little practice. I want you to, you can play this game for five minutes. Um, so not Minecraft if they're halfway through building their magnificent fortress. Choose something simple, maybe times table game, maybe something, something that they're not so invested in. And say to them, okay, after five minutes, we're going to stop. I'd choose a game as well, which is short and it resets frequently so that they don't have the opportunity to get as invested. Let them play for a couple of minutes and then ask them to give you the iPad. And when they do, even if it's a bit of a battle, as long as you eventually get it, which I'm sure you will, reward them with lots and lots of praise. If you want to do physical rewards of any kind, you can do stickers, a sweet, whatever you want, whatever you use as a reward system at home. But the important thing is that praise and attention. And just keep practicing because at the end of the day, as with anything, practice makes perfect. And the last situation I thought I'd talk about, so this is one for slightly older children particularly. They, as your child does get older, they're going to have those challenges of homework. And it can be pretty tricky to keep trying at something, to keep persevering, especially if it's something they find quite difficult. So if your child's getting frustrated with homework very easily, first of all, the important thing is to check in with your child's class teacher and see whether they have any concerns, whether you think they think that you need any additional support, whether they have the right homework for them. Um, but once, if your class teacher tells you that you, they feel that your child should be able to do this homework on their own at home, once you're, that can give you more confidence that it's actually a self-regulation skill that they need to learn. It's not so much that they can't do it. So what I would do then is try these strategies. First of all, definitely don't hover too much, especially if your child is that little bit older, if they are quite independent. If you're standing over them, waiting for them to do their homework, that's going to be quite a difficult feeling for them. Um, and they're also likely to reach out for you to help out to you for help unnecessarily, even if it's a task that they could already do on their own with just sort of a little bit more effort. If your child tells you that they really can't do the homework, they don't understand it, don't immediately sit down and say, OK, we'll do it all together. Say to them, OK, let's do the first question together or the first part together and then step away and encourage your child, child to try themselves. And as long as they try, even if they do need to come back to you for help, as long as they have done something, give them lots and lots and lots of praise. Could also be that your child's finding it tough to concentrate at home when you know that there are lots of fun things around to play with. In that case, you might want to, like with the iPad, try using a timer. Okay, we're gonna do 10 minutes on homework. Then you can have a five minute break to play with Lego or do whatever they like to do and then repeat it and, and try doing the homework in short breaks rather than in one big piece. And finally, if your child's becoming really frustrated and struggling to control their emotions when they're trying to do homework, suggest some mindfulness ideas or things that might support them in stepping away from those emotions. So, okay, when you start to feel like that, if you start to feel like your anger and frustrations bubbling up, this is what you're going to do. You're going to get up, you're going to drink, drink some water and then take a walk around the room or Let's try some, some breathing exercises. We can find loads of different breathing exercises online as well. And with any strategy that you decide to teach your child or that you think will work for your child, the most important thing, again, is to praise them each and every time you see them using it. If you've taught your child a breathing strategy to help them to calm their frustrations and you see them doing it, praise them. And eventually it will become second nature. Now, I hope you've enjoyed listening to this Parent Academy today. I hope I've been able to give you some useful tips and suggestions, but my final thought is probably the most important. Parenting is extremely tough. And when your child is learning to self-regulate and they're relying on you to co-regulate their emotions and their behavior, it can be incredibly stressful and incredibly exhausting. So it's absolutely essential that you put on your own oxygen mask first. You look after yourself first. Protect your own mental health by planning in time for yourself, taking short breaks if an interaction becomes really stressful with your child. Have somebody that you can talk to, whether it's a partner, a family member, a friend to chat to when things get tough. And of course, you can always speak to your child's class teacher 
or anybody at the, from the school that you feel comfortable speaking to as well. It's just so, so important that you do look after your own mental health, because if you're not in a good place, then you're going to find it very difficult to support your child in regulating their emotions and their behaviour. And only by regulating our own emotions and behaviour will we be in a position to teach our children to self-regulate. So then we'll have some lovely, happy looking children just like this. OK, so to finish off, I think we're going to have a little bit of time for you to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. If you do have those questions, pop them into the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer them. And while we are getting any questions in that you might have, Mr. Noack is going to share the survey that he mentioned earlier. Sure, thanks very much, Ms. Visserv. And uh, that, that was a fascinating topic and lots of great tips in there. I'll share that survey in just a moment. Do you know, I would like to just add a little bit on the end as well. You know, I, I read some research a couple of years ago that actually showed that children, they, they go into a state of high stress when you know, certain negative emotions or voice raising can be directed at them and makes it very difficult for them to solve their problem when they're in that state of stress. The interesting thing was that they experienced almost the exact same state of stress. They measured their brain waves and they saw identical patterns regardless of if that voice raising or negative emotions were directed at them or even at other people in their immediate family, such as another caregiver, a parent, a sibling, or something like that. So there is a tremendous amount of value in fostering a calm home environment, a family culture where we solve our problems cal uh, calmly, and even parents are like, we can show ways that we, strategies that we use to manage those big emotions. So all of that is very valuable and it's always good to remember that it's a skill that we have to teach them. It's a skill they learn. That was one thing I remember from the start of this presentation that really bears emphasizing. Thank you, one and all. Um, do we have any uh, questions yet, uh, Mr. Wall? I think we do have one. Aha, uh -huh. okay, now for screen time, regulating screen time. That's an interesting question. Ms. Visserven, would you like to comment on that one or would you like me to mention that? The question was that regulating screen time is very challenging indeed especially after introducing Minecraft, would you recommend any punishing or consequences for children breaking the rules? Would you like to comment that on that one, uh, Emily? Or would you like me to? to um, I don't mind, you can take that one if you want to. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic and very much a current one because on the one hand, we have programs that have a lot of value for children. They facilitate some great communication at schools. You know, the children show like put a lot of different uh, success skills into work. We I've observed a few of these uh, programs and actions and the children just interact at a very high level. They plan things out and you see a lot of, you know, the seeds of skills that will support them so well in their lives and in their future employment or studies, anything that they wish to do. But they are so attractive that sometimes children can get carried away with them. My, I, I would hesitate to use the word punishment in terms of what parents should do in this situation. But I do agree with a term such as as consequences. I think parents of all types need to be very clear about what the boundaries might be and establish in advance about what the consequences would be if they wouldn't do those and just to make sure that they stay in control of that. So I would probably go with appropriate consequences in this state might be uh, removing access to the Wi-Fi or that particular app for a set period of time and maybe give the student the chance to practice their um, self-regulation by setting their own timers and if they go over if they refuse to stop at the end then they know well that they would lose the wi-fi or lose access to the app for it can be up to you 24 hours three days whatever you deem appropriate and if they know that and if that happens consistently then you will get children who you know learn to adhere themselves to rules such as those i wouldn't necessarily remove access to these entirely but it's up to you as a family what rules you have for electronics at home, as long as the children are very clear on those rules, they can learn to have a healthy interaction with technology and things like that. Practicing that regulation would be very important for them as well, considering the sort of future that they're walking into. I hope that answers that question. I see that we've got that uh, forms link at the top as well. I think that uh, if you click on that link, 
in the chat function. We'd love to hear your perspective on what webinar you would like to see next. We, we've thought of a whole range of topics, so please choose one and we'll certainly take your perspective into account as we work towards our, our next parent webinar, which will be coming up in March. We, we have another question um, asking about how, do we, how can we support siblings in terms of their self-regulation and particularly helping siblings when they're fighting? Um, mm. shall, I, shall I answer this one, Mr. Nair? Sure, well, we both can. I certainly have some things to say about it as well. I'll leave you to start off and then maybe I'll add some thoughts as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say first, I think first of all, it's really important that with siblings that they both, that they all have their own space, that they, that's a safe space for them. So if they have their own bedroom, that's great. Um, if they're sharing a room, if they have somewhere particular that is theirs, whether it's their bed, whether they have a comfy chair that they like to sit in, a place that they know is theirs that, the, that their other siblings can't go to um, so that they do have somewhere to go to if they become very emotional and if they are struggling to regulate those emotions. Um, in, terms of, in terms of fighting, if siblings have already had a fight, I think the most important thing to do afterwards is to talk about it, um, make, speak about it separately with them, but then also speaking about it together and making sure that each sibling is given the opportunity to explain what happened from their perspective, how it made them feel. Um, at the end of the day, the only way that we can help children to understand the emotions of other people is by talking about it and, and sharing those feelings. So speaking as much as possible is very, very important. Um, I think with younger children, especially, it's very important to remember that um, there's a lot of research into theory of mind, which is that understanding of other people's perspectives and other people's feelings. Um, research shows that we don't think that children really develop that until around age six or seven. Um, so I think older siblings particularly, maybe it's important to have a chat with them and say, look, your, your little sister, your little brother, they don't quite understand yet the how to, how to think about the perspective of other people or how to think about how that may, might make other people feel. So it's important that we help them and we teach them. And sort of putting a little bit of responsibility on older siblings, I think can also be quite important. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Nair? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, this is a really key topic. I've been a close sibling myself. I have two siblings and my, my, I have two children, so obviously they're siblings. And I think this is an eternal struggle for parents. If I could recommend a couple of tricks as well, one thing that I think is really important is making individual time for each sibling. So maybe setting up special date times, like you know, you can take them out to a cafe individually, just where they get your full attention, either as a single parent or if you have a relative or a, a nanny who can look after one while you look after the other. Make those individual times so that they still have an individual connection with you as a parent. You are their lifeline. You're the reason that they can survive. So they feel that very strongly. So you can develop that relationship, not just children to parents as a sort of conglomerate or group, but them specifically with you specifically. And that puts them at ease more than anything else. Um, I, I will pick up on something that Emily said. I don't wish to repeat, but she mentioned about having individual time and also possessions. We almost take for granted sometimes that sharing is caring and it's always good. But I have heard psychologists speak about the importance of children feeling ownership of certain things that are their own. As adults, we might react a certain way if someone was to just take a mobile phone out of your hand and say, oh, but your husband also wants that. How about we give him a go of your mobile phone or, you know, even with a stranger or another member of the family, you might feel a bit put out as that's your phone and you've paid for it. And children themselves develop a strong connection with their toys and things like that. And they may feel a certain way, they may feel resentful towards a sibling very quickly if we take their favorite teddy bear or, or toy car or something and make them give it to their peers. So, you know, of course you might have toys that they should, that were bought for both of them that they can share, but don't overlook the sense of ownership they might feel for perhaps something that was given to them for their birthday or something that's specifically theirs. And if you can show that you respect those boundaries and things like that, that will provide that solid foundation for them to interact with their peers. There'll be less opportunity for those resentments uh, to come up. Um, so those are some good tricks there as well. But as I mentioned before about things like consequences, I would establish clear boundaries. For example, if children are 
physically uh, fighting, especially an older one with a younger one. I would draw a firm line there because the last thing you would want is, let's say, a smaller or a younger sibling to feel unsafe in their own home, or even an older one sometimes if they don't feel they can defend themselves if a younger sibling is is hitting them. You, you want home to be a calm and relaxing place to them. So I tend to recommend drawing quite a firm line on issues that you know cause them high stress or affect their safety and you know give them a timeout on a timer give them some calming down techniques but uh, you need to have a discussion as parents about where those lines are about what you strictly wouldn't allow or what a child might need to some time to calm down for and if they're in timeout you know you don't need to separate them that's a good time when you get them calm, but you reassure them that you love them and you talk through ways that they could handle situations better. Like, you know, they might say they hit or they shouted because they were very angry. Okay, what can we do when we're very angry? And it will take a while. You can almost use it like a mantra, like we breathe in or, you know, you, you do this or you do that and then you praise them when they do it. And over time, over time, it works quite well, but it does take time. They will make plenty of mistakes. If you were to teach them skiing, you can imagine how many times they might fall down before they get it right. Managing big emotions when you're in a state of high stress or just when you feel like you need something, imagine how many times they fall down and make mistakes there. So it's our job to love them and to care for them and to help guide them through that process of learning much as we would for a skill like skiing. Right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. We don't seem to have any more questions. I hope that's answered your question sufficiently. It is a topic that we're very passionate about. And as I said, this builds on into very important life skills for the students as well and for the children as they grow up. So thank you for joining us. We wish you a very happy Friday. We're looking forward to seeing your opinion on our next topics. And we can't wait to see you again in our next Parent Academy webinar. Thanks also to Ms. Visavan. Thanks for all those tips. They're very useful indeed. Thanks everyone. And thank you for your kind comments too. Have a lovely Friday.